Well, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for welcoming me to your seminar. And thank you, John, for the invitation. Um, you will, um, so at one point, so the, the, question, <clears throat> the question of the conference that uh, John put together uh, in 2013 was, uh, is essentially, is translation possible? Um, and it's a wonderful question. Uh, and there were some who answered yes and some who answered no. And um, you will see where I stand by the end of my, uh, by the end of my paper today. Um, but I, I asked John before um, we began as to how many were familiar with the, the, um, uh, the rabbinic translations into Aramaic of the Bible called the Targums. Um, and I don't know if you, if you are familiar with these. Forgive me if you're not. But um, uh, a Targum is a... Um, is a translation of the Hebrew text of the Old Testament uh, into Aramaic. But the Targums are a very specific genre of translation because unlike the latter uh, midrash of the rabbis, which was more a fuller uh, explanation and commentary on the biblical text, the Targums were actually developed over time to be read alongside the biblical text. So if you went to your synagogue for the weekly reading of uh, the lectionary reading of whatever it was in the, in the Torah or in the prophets, alongside that usually would have been someone who would have read the portion in the Targums. So the Targums were acted, uh, the, the word, um, even just the word Targum means, it doesn't just mean translation, it also means explanation. So the Targums were never meant to be read on their own or studied on their own, but they were meant to complement the readings of the Hebrew scripture. Okay, so it would be like walking into uh, a, a church on Sunday morning and someone uh, maybe gets up and reads from the Latin Vulgate and then someone reads a translation in the English but it's as if they were reading the translation in the English along maybe with the study notes, you know, if it was whatever, study Bible or something like that, and incorporating that into the explanation of the passage. So um, I'm explaining the Targums because otherwise you won't understand my paper <laughs> in, in the least. So let me just sum up um, the different types of Targums. So you have, you have two types. Um, there is one that I'll mention called uh, Targum... Some people spell this differently. Targum Onkelos. Um, targum Onkelos is the one targum that was likely formed mostly in Palestine, but is considered a Babylonian targum. Okay? Um, it was. Uh, it it's, it's likely has its formation later. Um, later, uh, mid Russian um, uh, rabbinic writings talk about the targum Onkelos as the Babylonian targum. So you have the Babylonian Targum, and then you have what you call the Palestinian Targum. Targum. And, there's, um, and there are basically a, a few of these, but there's one called Targum Neophyti. There's one called uh, Pseudo Jonathan. And then there is, I'm not going to spell it out, but the Cairo Geniza and the fragment targums and, and some other additional ones. But now, in terms of, of style or what, how these targums translate the Hebrew scripture, targum onkelos tends to be the most literal of all the translations, or at least the, most, um, the one that sticks closest to the Hebrew text. Now, Targum Neophyti and Pseudo-Jonathan and the Cairo Geniza and the Fragment Targums, they tend to incorporate um, a bit more uh, what they call Haggadah or interpretation. So, um, so they, will, uh, they will add things into the he what was the Hebrew text in Aramaic as part of the explanation of the passage. So it's not um, impossible for them to add, sometimes to add large sections of explanation if the text is, um, is unclear in the Hebrew. So the Targums potentially go back um, to, well, depending on which scholar you talk to, the Targums can date back to the Second Temple period and the period of Ezra and Nehemiah. And the, the verse that is key in this is Nehemiah 8.8. 8. And Nehemiah 8.8 8 talks about the, uh, Ezra getting up to read the law. 
and it was read clearly, and it was made, uh, it doesn't say it was translated, but it was made clear to the people. And most, uh, a lot of scholarly interpreters interpret that mean, to mean that it was, it was read in Hebrew, the law was read, read in Hebrew, and then it was translated into Aramaic so the people could understand. Because by the time we're in the Second Temple period and the Persian period, Aramaic becomes uh, the, the everyday language of the Jewish people. So, um, <clears throat> so the Targums, as we have them, so Targum, Onkelos, and Naophidi, and Suda Jonathan, and these others, are not so much just simply translations, but they are bodies of literature that have interpretations that could stem back to 3rd or 4th century BC up until 7th or 8th century CE. And what's so fascinating about them is that they're not just a, it's not just a single translation. It is, uh, it, it is incorporated into it is this breadth of, of Jewish theology, really, over the ages. Um, so it's difficult to speak of a translator when you talk of the Targums, because you're talking about generations upon generations. Some have added, some, um, some maybe have taken away. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, so there's good reason to believe that the Targums most likely date back uh, prior to the time of Christ um, in the Jewish. But, but we know that from kind of uh, from second, third century CE, that these were used consistently in the synagogues. Um, one of the interesting things about the Targum, sorry, then I'll, I'll finally get to my paper. I promise I'll finish at five, half five. Um, <clears throat> but one of the interesting things about the Targums is um, one of the, one of the, they were they were regulated by the rabbis, and one of the interesting things is that is that one of the regulations was, in the synagogue when the targums were read, um, the Hebrew scripture when when the portion of Hebrew scripture was read in the synagogue, uh, the the person who read it even if they had it memorized had to look at the scroll or look at the text to make it look like he was reading the text, so you knew that he was reading the word of God. But for the Targums, uh, because it was not the word of God, because it was the Targum, the interpretation, the Targum, the person reading the Targums had to look up from the text. So they had to essentially have the Targum memorized so it didn't look like they were reading specifically from it. Um, this was one of the rabbinic uh, rules about reading the Targums. Okay. Um, I'll save your questions for the end, but let me dive into this paper in terms of translation. <clears throat> so the, the title of this is um, When Yahweh Comes Down, Translating Defi Divine Descent in the Book of Exodus. The anthropomorphism of God descending from his heavenly throne to enter into the physical realm of humanity is often conveyed by a Hebrew verb, um, and again, sorry, we don't have Hebraists among us, but um, you're going to hear me say, well, for those Hebraists among us, it's Yarad. Um, for those who are not familiar with Hebrew, we'll just spell it like that. <laughs> Yarad is the, uh, is the Hebrew verb, and the verb just simply means to descend or go down, and oftentimes it's attributed to God coming down from the heavens. Now, this same verb can be used to describe human descent as well, as well, and the biblical authors make no effort to distinguish between how God and human beings go down or descend. Instead, it is apparent that at certain points in the biblical narrative, God comes down as if physically moving from one geographical location to another to see what is happening on earth and to reveal himself to his people. This anthropomorphism, often found in the traditional J source of the Pentateuch, seems to imply that despite his transcendence over all creation, Yahweh can and will visit his people at specific times and places, whether to bring judgment or salvation or to meet with Moses and the Israelites. This is particularly true in the book of Exodus, where, where to go down or descend, Yarad, occurs, occurs 20 times, and of those, six occurrences refer to Yahweh's descent from the heavens. Now, it's possible that the language of God descending may have been a remnant of Canaanite or Babylonian literary tradition, but it was nevertheless adapted by and accepted by the time the biblical text reached its final composition. <laughs> 
Yet despite the frequent use of dissent language in Exodus, it seems that the biblical redactors may have been somewhat reluctant with the concept of the divine entering into human space, since we were reminded that Yahweh spoke to the Israelites, quote, from the heavens when delivering the commandments in Exodus 20, 22, despite the fact that he had just descended down upon Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. So this theological dialectic within the book of Exodus regarding Yahweh's descending raises the question of how subsequent translators would approach the language of divine descent and how they would accurately convey the movement of God's presence from the heavens to the earthly realms to their particular audiences. Now, most of the ancient versions of Exodus tend to retain this anthropomorphic language of Yahweh descending. The Samaritan Pentateuch maintains the use of Yarad um, throughout its translations. Um, The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, consistently renders it with katabino, which just means to descend. And in the Vulgate, Jerome frequently renders with descend or go down, um, whether it refers to God or human beings. And in the Peshitta, we find the same. It is, however, only in the Aramaic Targums that we, find that, when, uh, that we discover a distinct translational tendency to avoid anthropomorphic language when used in con- conjunction with the divine. So the Targums in almost every instance of the Pentateuch where it says that Yahweh descends or goes down, translate with the, uh, with the passive expression to be revealed. Uh, <clears throat> And in the instance where, um, where Yarad or to go down refers to human descent, then it, ref- then it uh, translates with the normal Aramaic word, nachath, um, which just means to descend. So, but when it's used of Yahweh, it's always translated with this passive sense of be revealed. Yahweh w- reveals himself. Now, in his significant study on the Targumic tendency to avoid anthropomorphic and anthropopathic language when referring to the divine, um, M.L. Klein argues that when verbs of motion are used in a divine context, they tend to be translated in such a way as to avoid anthropomorphism. Klein compares every reference to God in the Hebrew Bible, along with its Targumic renderings, and, uh, and contends that there is no single explanation for the different translations. Sometimes the Targumists retain anthropomorphisms, and sometimes they surpass MT, the Masoretic text, in explicitness of divine attributes. And in many instances, the Targums use circumlocutory words or phrases in references to God that places a buffer or a distance between divine human encounters. Now, in the case of divine descent language in Exodus, it seems that the Targumic translators sought to avoid anthropomorphic language by consistently describing Yahweh's active physical descent with the passive to be revealed. And this seems to denote that the entrance of the divine presence into human affairs in Exodus was one of unveiling rather than the entrance of the divine presence into human affairs, um, oh, sorry, rather than one connoting Yahweh's physical movement from the heavenly spheres into the earthly. Now, there are only six occurrences in Exodus that describe Yahweh's descent from heaven. And so we can just take a look at, uh, I think we have time to take a look at each one of these to see how uh, the Aramaic Targums translate this. And the first example is Exodus 3.8, where Yahweh reveals himself to Moses in the form of the burning bush. And God promises Moses that he will come down to deliver his people from the oppression of the Egyptians in order to bring them to the promised land. In this instance, all of the Targums translate the Hebrew, <clears throat> this is in the Hebrew, quote, and I have come down, with, and I have revealed myself. Uh, while Targum Neophyte is slightly modified to, re- uh, to read, and I have been revealed in my memra, uh, memra in Targum Neophyte is often um, a term used to, devi- to, de- to describe the divine glory, uh, the, the Shekinah glory. Uh, And and thus the Aramaic translation conveys the sense of God's presence being known to his people for the sake of their deliverance from Egyptian persecution, but it does so by distancing Yahweh's intervention to something that happens while he somehow remains in the heavens. The glory of his Shekinah may be revealed on earth, but Yahweh himself does not come down. Now, the majority of occurrences of to descend, Yahweh descending in Exodus, come in chapter 19, 
in the often perplexing theophany at Mount Sinai, where Moses and the Israelites received the covenant law. And at this point in the narrative, Yahweh has revealed himself in the burning bush and in the pillar of cloud and fire that guides the Israelites out of Egypt into the wilderness of Sinai. And when the Israelites set up camp at the base of the mountain, Moses goes up to receive instructions from God, and he is told to sanctify the people and be ready for the third day. <clears throat> and quote, this is quote from, quote from Exodus chapter um, uh, verse 11, chapter 19. For on the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all people upon Mount Sinai. Now, once again, the Targum translations avoid the anthropomorphism of Yahweh's descent and translate will be revealed, um, or as Targum Neophyti makes more explicit, the glory of the Shekinah of the Lord will be revealed. Um, it should be noted that at this point, um, the Hebrew verb, uh, this Hebrew verb, yarad, to descend, is, is used frequently of Moses descending, going up and down, but never of Yahweh in this passage. Now, when we come to the actual moment of revelation, Yahweh's descent upon, upon Mount, Mount Sinai brings about an awful and fearful sight. And in the Hebrew Bible, we are told, quote, Mount Sinai was wrapped up in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in, in fire. And the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And the Targums agree in their translation that Yahweh, or his Shekinah, was revealed in the great fire. Uh, the only significant addition to the revelation on Mount Sinai comes in Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, who explains how the Lord revealed himself. And quote, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord had inclined the heavens to it and revealed himself upon it in a glowing fire. And the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. So that, end quote, that the Lord had inclined the heavens uh, can be understood through the rabbinic discussion um, of how Yahweh revealed himself in, at Sinai in the words of uh, another rabbinic text called the, um, the Mekilta de Rab Ishmael, a later, a later commentary on the Bible. Um, and this is a quote from the Mekilta. Uh, for, <clears throat> for from heaven I have spoken to you, teaching us that the Holy One, blessed be he, bowed down the lower heavens and the upper heavens of heavens upon the top of the mountain, and the glory descended. Hayward notes that the language of bowing down the heavens is found in Psalm 1810, which is followed by Yahweh's descent on the cherub in verse 11. And he cites other rabbinic voices that were reluctant to believe that Yahweh's glory came down to the earth. And he concludes that, quote, Pseudo-Jonathan seemingly assumes that his readers have knowledge not only of this statement, but also of subsequent rabbinic modification of it to avoid open conflict with Scripture's unequivocal statement that God did indeed go down. The distinction between the upper and lower heavens made by the rabbis was yet another way to deal with the anthropomorphism found in the Hebrew Bible. In order, to avoid any, in order to avoid any misunderstanding of Yahweh's presence on earth, Pseudo-Jonathan's rendering includes the fact that Yahweh, this is, this is wonderful, I wish I don't have the, um, the actual Targum with me, but Pseudo-Jonathan, the one that is, has often offers the most explanation, says <clears throat> in Exodus 19, 17, 17, says that, uh, includes the fact that Yahweh actually tore up the whole of Mount Sinai from the ground and raised it up towards heaven. So not only did Yahweh come down a little bit, but he actually tore Mount Sinai up. And again, it's just this, this Targumic um, tendency, this rabbinic tendency to create that buffer between human and divine as much as possible. They just weren't comfortable with with this anthropo well, always come through with this anthropomorphic language of of God entering in and being too close to humanity, so God even put, lifts up Mount Sinai from the from the earth so that He can deliver His law. So after the description of the Sinai <coughs> of Sinai being covered with smoke and fire, we are reminded in Exodus nineteen twenty that the Lord came down upon the mountain and Moses went up to meet Him. Once again, the Targums agree that Yahweh did not come down, but was revealed upon Mount Sinai and made manifest some form of his Shekinah glory. And therefore, the, the Targums translate the, revel the revelation of God at Sinai during the covenant-making event by avoiding any anthropomorphism depicting Yahweh as one who descends from the heavens to meet his people or his servant Moses. Instead, the covenant between God and Israel is enacted through a safe distance whereby Yahweh remains in his abode while still revealing some form of his glory. Um, 
let's see. Okay, I'll skip over the last example. We'll go, we'll go on here to, um, to what is, I think, uh, some of the crux of this. So one aspect of the wilderness uh, narrative in uh, the book of Exodus that has often puzzled commentators over the centuries has been uh, the inclusion of what's called the tent of meeting as it's described in Exodus 33, 7 to 11. It's often thought that this to be a fragment of an older tradition assigned to the E source that has no relation to the chapter, but represents an earlier concept of the tabernacle tra tradition Despite the debates on the age or source of the passage, it is apparent that the tent of meeting, as represented in Exodus 33.9, differs from the description of the, the tent or tabernacle uh, of Exodus 25.8 uh, <clears throat> in terms of its construction and proximity to the Israelites. The tabernacle is meant to be the place where God continually will dwell in the midst of his people, whilst the tent of meeting is located outside the camp where Moses only met periodically with God. The tabernacle is to be constructed with ornate beauty fit for the presence of a king, whilst the tent of meeting is simple, unadorned, and a place where intimate conversation takes place. Moses goes outside the camp, symbolically away from the impurity of the Israelites, to a temporary space where he can meet with the divine. And the presence of God descended in the form of, quote, a pillar of cloud. And the Israelites watched at a distance and fell down to worship in awe. And that these meetings took place outside the camp is also significant because it indicates a type of meeting that Moses initiated uh, and not God. It was also a place where Moses spoke to God face to face, the quote face to face, as a friend, denoting the fact that these theophanies are somehow different in nature to what we have previously seen at Sinai, but may recall the more intimate encounter in Exodus 3 through the burning bush. So we have these two um, depictions of of Moses going to meet with God in the book of Exodus, one being the tabernacle tradition and one this, this somewhat strange unknown tradition of, of, in Exodus 33 of this tent of meeting, whereby Moses initiates the dialogue and the conversation. And as Moses enters the tent of meeting, that pillar of cloud that Yahweh descends in uh, comes down. So it's a, as confused biblical scholars, I think, for centuries, centuries, we won't solve it here. Talk about translation instead. So in Exodus 33, 9, uh, we're told that Moses went into the tent of meeting, uh, uh, the tent of meeting, and the pillar of cloud would come down, uh, or would descend and come down, and Yahweh would speak to him. And then verse 11 reiterates, thus Yahweh used to speak to Moses face to face. That kind of unprecedented claim in the biblical text. In this instance, however, Targum Onkelos, Targum Neophiti, and Pseudo Jonathan all translate the Hebrew descend, Yarad, with the Aramaic descend. It is the only instance in all the instances where Yarad of God descending is used that they also translate with the Aramaic to descend rather than with the customary be revealed or was revealed. <clears throat> all of the Atargums avoid, uh, the, avoid the latter anthropomorphism of Moses speaking with Yahweh face to face uh, and translate that Moses spoke with Yahweh speech to speech. But they felt no need to interpret the descent of Yahweh in the pillar of clouds with the revelatory language that we have seen throughout Exodus. Similar passages where God's descent in the form of a cloud also occur at Numbers 11 uh, and 12. But in both these instances, in those instances, the Targums render Yarad, the Hebrew, with the, uh, with, again, with the passive be revealed. Thus, we are left with the question of why, in this one instance, did the Targumic translators not feel the need to move away from the anthropomorphic descent language, but rather chose to speak of Yahweh coming down or descending to meet with Moses in the tent. Now, one possible reason <clears throat> is that Exodus 33.9 does not include the use of the tetragrammaton, or the, the four letters that symbolize uh, Yahweh's name. And thus the translators felt there was enough of a distance between the association of Yahweh and the pillar of cloud to include the language of descent without worrying about possible anthropomorphism. <clears throat> 
Now, this may be the best possible interpretation, but it does not take into account the fact that Yahweh is clearly associated with the pillar of cloud throughout Exodus and the rest of the Pentateuch and is named as the speaker in verse 11. <clears throat> it may be that the translators associated the angel of the Lord as the initial speaker in verse 9, since Yahweh is not specifically named. And this would follow a similar pattern of revelation seen in the burning bush narrative where we're told that the angel of the Lord first appeared to Moses and then afterwards God spoke. Another possibility is that the translation was theologically motivated. In reference to the consistent Targum translation of go down with was revealed, Drazen argues that, that, quote, care should be taken not to read more into anthropomorphisms than warranted. The Magid of Merzes taught that the in the name of the Baal Shem Tov that Targum Ankalas' was revealed means that revelation comes within the perception of everyone to each according to his capacity. This is good theology, but it is neither the meaning nor the intent of the Targums, end quote. But can we be so bold as to assert that the Targumic translators did not have theological motivations behind their translations of Yahweh coming down to his people? In previous passages where God's descent was associated with the covenant ratification at Sinai in Exodus 19 and the possible covenant renewal in Exodus 34, the translators chose the language of Yahweh's presence being revealed rather than his descending. In Exodus 33, 9, however, the context of Yahweh's descent has changed. At this particular moment in the narrative, Israel had broken their covenant <coughs> with Yahweh through the sin of the golden calf, and his promise to dwell in their midst had been suspended. Moses initiates his meeting with Yahweh away from the Israelites uh, to speak to him face to face, but there remains some ambiguity surrounding Israel's future covenantal status at this point in the narrative. It is possible that the Targum translate, translations of descend in Exodus 33.9 were somehow influenced by the context of Yahweh coming down to speak to Moses in a manner that was distinct from when his glory was revealed. Here was a more intimate, personal setting where Moses and God alone spoke to one another as a friend, as a friend speaks to a friend. Despite the Targum translation of, quote, face to face with speech to speech, uh, it is possible that the translators recognized the context of Moses' meeting and felt that in this one instance, it was possible that Yahweh came down to meet with his servant. Now, latter rabbinic interpretations struggled with this notion of Yahweh's descent and, and the presence of his Shekinah on earth. <clears throat> and how could the transcendent God of all creation make his presence known at certain times and places without appearing to be divided in his essence or being? Some rabbis justified God's revelation to Moses and his presence on earth, while others, like Rabbi Jose, ar argued that, quote, the Shekinah never descended to earth, nor did Moses and Elijah ever ascend to heaven. As it is said, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth hath given he, the earth he hath given to the sons of men. End quote. The statement was reconciled with scripture by other rabbis who argued that God did descend, <clears throat> but only by ten handbreadths towards the earth. So Moses and Elijah ascended to heaven, but again, only by ten handbreadths. So the, the rabbis were wonderful at creating these, these kind of caveats in how, in how we understand the biblical text. So, so, so God did come down, but he only came down a little bit. And then Moses and Elijah did ascend, but they only ascended a little bit. And then not, not quite the full, they didn't go the full way. Um, other rabbinic commentaries also suggest the difficulty in understanding how Yahweh makes his presence known upon earth and how the Shekinah re was revealed in its different manifestations. And it's likely that the Targum translator, translators wrestled with similar questions when approaching the Hebrew text. Yet having examined the instances of divine descent in the biblical text, it appears that they were willing, at least in one instance, to say that God did indeed come down. Now, the second, the second portion of this paper um, is a bit more theoretical um, in response to the question that was set by John uh, in terms of, is translation possible? So we'll, we'll shift gears from the biblical text and move it just into a bit more of translation theory, theory and how we understand uh, these concepts around translation in the biblical text. <clears throat> 
In the light of the question, is translation possible? <clears throat> we might ask whether or not the Targum somehow flatten the Hebrew text without preserving its original intended meaning. This might support the notion that translation is in fact impossible. We may, however, read the Targums of Exodus through the lens of their particular cultural, cultural and religious and sociological backgrounds and argue that they do provide appropriate language concerning divine descent that allowed the readers of their day to comprehend a distinct vision of how Yahweh's presence entered the world. In this sense, we can agree with uh, Martha Kirkwick and James Aitkins, who are presenters at the conference, uh, their point on the necessity to move from mere grammatical equivalences in translation to a broader level of how a text communicates ideas. So in the case of the Targums, we might appeal to the work of Paul Ricoeur. I don't know if anyone is familiar, you're probably more familiar with his work than I am, <clears throat> but I came across this and thought it was fascinating and raise the question about our sensitivity to symbolic language, especially as it relates to revelation. Through the Hebrew Bible and its though the Hebrew Bible and its translations are filled with metaphor and vision and myth, we cannot be quick to dismiss how the original authors and translators sought to communicate meaning that stretches beyond the literal. Now, Ricoeur argues that we as modern readers must enter into uh, a second naivete, in our approach to biblical texts that use symbolic and metaphoric language, and the same can be said for reading translations. The first naivete suggests a pre-modern understanding that does not question dwelling amidst the richness of symbol in the world and in language. If this was the case for ancient thinkers, Ricoeur, Ricoeur argues that this is no longer possible for modern interpreters, and so encourages today's reader to re-feel the text in a neutralized mode with a reenactment of the imagination. Unlike Bultmann's project of demythologi demythologization, uh, demythologizing the biblical text, which ignores the question of how biblical language in its various literary forms conveys sense and meaning, Ricoeur argues that the symbol is, in fact, an indicator of reality that enables us to discern meaning that otherwise could not be discerned. He contends that, quote, the symbol used as a means of detecting and deciphering human reality will have been verified by its power to raise up, to illuminate, to give order to that region of human experience, end quote. Thus, when approaching the symbols of the text, the reader can enter into the experience of the narrative by various paths of metaphor and language without ever hoping to bridge the gap of perfect semantic equivalence. Ricoeur wants to capture, recapture the fullness of language revealed in the biblical text by being attentive to the range of expression that is found in myth and symbol. For it is in the symbolic and metaphorical language that we discover our capacity to articulate experiences that give us a basis for reflective reasoning. If myth is confined to, it, confined to its literal function and bound in objective critical understanding, there remains the potential for losing that which the scripture reveals to us beyond our own realities. And so we cannot, as Boltmann does, rely on an independent conceptuality that exists within us to discern, to discern the meaning of a text once it is demythologized, but rather we allow the scripture to engender the questions, to provoke the ideas and, and experience within us. And Ricoeur calls this the, the, quote, interval of interrogation and contends that we cannot be estranged from the ancient world of the text, but need to understand it within its theological context as meaning translated between two languages as well as between different communities of faith. The reader is therefore challenged with the task of reading the symbolic language of scripture and its translation in such a way, <clears throat> in such a way that maintain, maintains its multiplicity of meaning and does not exhaust its potential for varying translations. So if we consider the Targum renderings that we were discussing before from this perspective, we might say that their translations were, quote, successful in the sense that they have chosen the most appropriate language to express the symbol of Yahweh's divine presence appearing amidst Israel in their particular historical context. So in order to preserve the symbol and sign of Yahweh's presence in the wilderness, the translators felt compelled 
to speak with language that distanced humanity from the mystery of the Shekinah as it was revealed to their ancestors. If the world of symbol is expressive of humanity's encounters with the divine and reaches levels of reality that cannot be comprehended otherwise, it is possible that the, despite the translator's reluctance to use anthropomorphic language when conveying the nature of divine descent and exodus, they retain the sense of the original text and the symbol of divine presence, as Ricoeur might say. The reader, therefore, can appreciate the possibility of a plurality of meanings in the Targum translations through the, through the complex poetics involved in interpretation of li linguistic meaning. Ricoeur takes us one step further, and, <clears throat> and though his reference is to the world of the biblical text, the same might be true of the, tr of the translated text. In speaking of the, quote, world of the text, he argues, quote, by this I mean that what is finally to be understood in a text is not the author or his presumed intention, nor is it the imminent structure or structures of the text, but rather the sort of world intended beyond the text as its reference. In this regard, the alternative, either the intention or the structure, is in vain, end quote. If we move beyond the presumed intentions of the Targumis uh, and their free or literal rend renderings, we might ask the question what they communicate about the world of the text through, <clears throat> through their renderings of divine descent in Exodus. Because Yahweh does not come down, we sense that, that the world of divine presence experienced by the Israelites during the Exodus was one of unveiling rather than one of God's physical movement. Yahweh, as it were, uncovered his glory at particular moments in time to reveal himself to his people. And there was no need for him to come down from the heavens, but rather it's as if his glory shone through the heavenly realms and glimpses of it were perceived by the Israelites as he led them through the wilderness. Yet when Moses met with God face to face in the tent of meeting, the translators retained the more anthropomorphic language of descent, possibly to convey a world where even the fullness of Yahweh's glory could at times enter into human realms and communicate with his children. In all translations, we must continually address the questions of intentionality, possible reasons behind the use of particular lexemes or syntax and the historic setting in which the translation was composed. But we also must move beyond this to the meaning of the text itself as it guides us in a particular direction through its world. The search for absolute equivalence in translation will ultimately lead to frustration since translation is a dialogical act that remains preliminary and constantly unfolding. Translation is therefore possible because it is a process whereby the communication of ideas seeks adequacy and not exact equivalence, whether in syntax and lexemes, in a dialogical setting. So the conversational aspect of translation is what Ricoeur calls, I love this phrase, he calls it linguistic hospitality. Linguistic hospitality, it's such a wonderful, just inviting words into another, into another home, which attempts to bring the reader to the text and the text to the reader in such a way that requires a type of openness and welcoming of foreign words and concepts. Just a uh, quote, Quote from Ricoeur, just as it is, <clears throat> just as in the act of telling a story, we can translate differently without hope of filling the gap between equivalence and total adequacy. Lingui linguistic hospitality then is where the pleasure of dwelling in, another's, in, others, in the other's language is balanced by the pleasure of receiving the foreign word at home in one's, uh, in one's own welcoming house, end quote. The notion of hospitality in translation moves us away from the idea that we can produce replicas of original texts in other languages towards an openness to the multiplicity of meanings that might emerge when one is willing to welcome foreign words or concepts into one's own house. Out of this type of engagement comes a transfer of meaning and understanding from one language to another that is never static or fixed, but like dialogue is ever unfolding with new meanings and possibilities. When we consider the Targum translations of divine descent in the light of linguistic hospitality, we can see how the translators welcomed biblical terms and concepts, but reproduced them in their own language in such a way that brings out their own nuanced understanding <clears throat> of how God comes down to earth.
Thank you. <laughs>